just want to say something before we get started. I should probably introduce myself at least. I'm Rob Rivero. Um, this talk has, comes at a very interesting time because I was, uh, I got up <coughs> yesterday morning, I think it was, sat down to eat breakfast, got a notification that there was a podcast. I don't know if anybody follows JS Jabber, the JavaScript podcast, and they were talking about tooling fatigue, JavaScript tooling <laughs> fatigue. So it's a very interestingly timed topic. Um, I was like, should I give this, should I even give this talk at this point? Uh, but there's, there's a debate raging among the thought leaders of the JavaScript community as to whether all of these things make sense. Um, given that I decided to continue to go ahead and give the talk, I'm obviously in the camp that says these things still matter. Um, they're highly valuable. but. There are people that would say, you know, there are ways to do this without all these tools, all these dependencies, but I think the power they give uh, is well worth it, so I figured that was worth worth saying before we get started. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at AzureLogic. You can check out my blog, HTTPS, AzureLogic.com. Uh, I'm an IU grad. I have my master's in uh, CS and applied math from here. I do .NET, Node.js. Uh, plain old JavaScript and Angular. I work for a company called Apparatus out of Indy. Um, <coughs> I'm a senior consultant there, working on various projects, both internal and external. And that is a man of war. If you play Black Ops 3 on PS4, you'll get shot by me with one of those. <laughs> so this is actually uh, part of a roadmap of, of a series of talks that I'd like to give. Obviously, I want to give everybody in the community a chance to give talks, but inevitably there will be some month where there's not a chance. And so this is on a roadmap towards eventually talking about Angular 2.0 with a topic, uh, a talk on ES6 sitting in the middle. Um, we're going to talk. Angular 2.0 is quite is, a, is not released yet, so I'm gonna, I want to wait until that's even a thing, a real thing that we can start doing in production. Um, but I think ES6 is. Um, is something we're talking about. For those that aren't familiar, ES6 is the next version of JavaScript. Um, there are a whole bunch, and, and there are more iterations uh, in the pipeline. There's a, there's a uh, committee called the TC39 that governs uh, ECMAScript, or, uh, which is essentially the formal uh, standard on which JavaScript is based. And uh, they have moved into a pattern where they're going to be doing yearly updates to the language, and uh, ES6 is the, the biggest step forward for JavaScript in a long time. So I wanted to give that talk, but I thought this talk needed to happen first, uh, because getting the tools ready so that you can easily use ES6 uh, is going to be important. We'll talk a little more about it a little later in the talk, but I want to bring it up. So why should we care about these kinds of things? Well, there's four big things that all really matter in software. Reproducibility, you want to make sure that your builds work right the same every time. That's why things like continuous integration, continuous deployment exist. You know, we care very much about that. We care about quality. I mean, the among, above almost, uh, it needs to work above all else. And we want it, in, on top of that, there's also the concept of your code being clean and of high quality in terms of being readable. So there are tools that can help in both aspects. One, maintaining uh, correctness of your code, and two, maintaining cleanliness. Um, with cleanliness of code comes maintainability, and then also reusability. So how can we make these things modular and not have to reinvent the wheel every time we do this stuff? So there's seven classes, I mean there are more than this, but seven classes of tools that I'm gonna talk about tonight. Package managers, Unit test frameworks and test runners, linters, build tools, transpilers, module loaders, and scaffolders. Uh, that's pretty much the end of the slide. We're going to go through each of those. Um, package managers, unit test frameworks, and build tools are the, the focus of this talk, but we're going to take a moment at the end to talk a little bit about each of those, uh, provided that I still have time. <laughs> Otherwise, we're just going to flip through this slide. So, um, the first big thing is package management. And who here has used any form of a package manager before? I think more people in here have used it than they think, maybe. <laughs> if, you've, if, you've used, if you've used Linux, 
and no uh, aptitude, APT, um, or if you're from the Fedora family, YUM, um, those are package managers for Linux. Some of them are installing libraries, some are installing executables. Uh, Ruby has, what is it, Ruby Gems? Uh, Python has pip. You know, so there are all of these package managers out there for various languages. One of the things that's interesting about JavaScript, and, and, or I should say more so specifically, Node.js, um, which is server-side JavaScript, is it was the it was really one of the first, I don't know, we'll call it a language independent of JavaScript for the sake of this. It's the first language to, to really happen after, you know, GitHub happened and the idea of, of package managers really came into vogue and, and the idea that we should have one for a language came into vogue. So it really got into an interesting position. Um, and the one that took that place is NPM, or Node Package Manager. It's a JavaScript package repository, which makes sense from everything I've described about it. It includes front-end libraries, back-end libraries, and standalone executables. For, so some, a lot of the tools we're going to be talking about using actually uh, are installed through NPM, so I want to start here. You install this with Node.js. Um, so if you install <laughs> Node, you automatically get NPM. Um, for those on OS X and Linux, I highly recommend a tool called NVM, or Node Version Manager. It allows you to put Node <coughs> into a user control folder, which means no more sudo NPM install, such and such. Basically, there's no need for using uh, super user rights to do anything with Node. There are supposedly some equivalents on Windows, but I've not <laughs> tested them. I can't vouch for their capacity in any way, shape, or form. So let's go ahead and do a little bit with NPM. Let's in the, we're going to initialize a package. We're going to, we're going to initialize our own, um, call it a package. Um, install some other packages and install some globals. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Can everybody read that? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so first thing we do is an npm init inside of whatever directory you want as sort of the base of your project. So this walks us through things, gives us a couple of defaults. You're not allowed to have capitals in your name, so <coughs> We're just going to let it be version 1.0. This is a demo. We don't care about the entry point. Entry point matters more if we were actually publishing this to NPM. So there's two parts really to talk about NPM. One is how to use it to consume it. The other is how to publish packages. We're not going to cover that part tonight because that is way out of scope of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, test command. So if you know what your test runner, however it's going to start up, you can go ahead and put that in here now. We're going to leave that out for now because that's still coming. We don't know how we're going to test. We don't even know anything about you to test again. Um, it automatically knew where my Git repository was. I'm not publishing this, so I'm not caring about this. You guys can all have it at MIT. This is all good, and for some reason, this thing is going to hang up. So we're going to kill that. And what we get out is something called package.json. So let's go ahead and cat that. And you'll see all the stuff that I basically just went through in the prompts. The name of the package was put in there, the description, uh, the default main was index.js, license, etc. So nothing super exciting there, but uh, it's something that we have to have to go ahead and get started. So once we have... <laughs> Is it dying over there? So let's go ahead and install some packages. I'm going to, for this uh, demo, we're going to go ahead and need Angular. And let's go ahead and cap that again. Nothing really changed. And this is important because. I installed Angular, but if someone else were to download this as is, you know, pull this off of Git, if I push this up to GitHub and you pulled it down, and you ran NPS, if you were to try to make this work, you would not get Angular. And that's because you need to save it. 
So you give dash dash save. It can come before or after the package name. You can list multiple packages in here. So if I needed lodash as well, I can go ahead and I can even split them. And now we cap that package JSON. We now see a new thing that's been added to the bottom, dependencies. We're going to talk a little bit more about the numbers that went with that uh, when we get back to the slides. But now we know what the dependencies of this package are. Now on top of that, one of the packages, a little bit of ahead knowledge, is that I know I'm going to be talking about Gulf. So let's go ahead and save Gulf. But I don't need this in production. So we can save dev. Maybe. <laughs> Come on, at and Got that, and now we have dev dependencies. The difference between dependencies and dev dependencies is when there is a particular environment variable node end that that node looks for. If that is set to production, those will not install. Unlo there is an override for that, and I cannot remember it off the top of my head. I may have included it in the slides. Um, so that's all great. Now, one of the things that Gulp has is it has a runner. So it's a command I can type. And since I installed it, I can gulp, right? Actually, that wasn't supposed to work. I forgot that it's already installed on my machine. <laughs> so that was supposed to not work. So the way that we can go ahead and install gulp correctly, um, let's assume that that never happened. <laughs> so we npm install the global dash g. And now that will go ahead and install that into a global cache of packages that I can access from any directory. So let's go ahead and cancel that since we already know that that's installed. Uh, this is just a directory. There's no package JSON. Gulp still works here. Are you kidding me? <laughs> All right. So. I lied. I didn't practice that one. <coughs> so we'll go ahead and let Gulf install globally. So we now know how to initialize a package JSON. We know how to save some dev dependencies and regular dependencies, and we know the difference between those. We know how to install globals. So basically, we can start pulling down all kinds of software. And not do anything with it. So let's go ahead and flip back though so we can understand a little more about what we just did. So if you want to understand more about package JSON, I'm not going to have time to go through everything that can possibly go in there. There's a really great interactive guide where you can like hover over the individual properties in a, in a fully completed package JSON uh, and see explanations for each piece. Two things are required, name and version. There are Three other really interesting things that we can put in there from a point of view of, of writing software using package JSON. We talked about dependencies and dev dependencies. Um, this was what I was talking about. Um, if you put in dash dash dev while you do npm install, um, it will go ahead and install the dev dependencies even if you're in production. Um, one of the other ones, though, that we haven't talked about yet is one called scripts. So you can put a, a property in your package JSON called scripts, and that then can have properties install, test, start, stop, restart, pre-install, post-install, pre-test, post-test, pre-start, post-start, et cetera. And there are a few more beyond that that have to do more with publishing. Uh, but these are the important ones that I really want to focus here on are install and test, because you can then do npm test, and it will run your test command, or you can hook other scripts to your install. So one of the things that you cannot do is put a global, a, you can't put inside of dependencies a global dependency. So we talked about installing gulp as a global, right? 
you can't tell a package that it needs a global dependency. But we can do this. So we have these scripts. I don't use Vim very much, so part of my terrible Vim's go. Which, by the way, is something I didn't get a chance to demo. If you do npm install without any arguments to it, it will go through all of your dependencies and install all of them. And all your dev dependencies in the case of uh, dev. So you'll notice that it went ahead and ran npm install dash g gulp. So just like I said, npm scripts work. And actually, I did this out of order because there's a demo slide where we're actually supposed to do that, but that's OK. It makes more sense here, so. That makes sense so far? All right. Well, let's talk about Semver. Who's heard of Semver? Less popular than some of the other things. <laughs> so Semver, or semantic versioning, is a very important topic, and I encourage, if you ever make a library or do anything in the realm of like putting out software, follow Semver. Be nice to, to your users. Um, <laughs> Semver is important because it creates a standard around how we should version our projects. Semver has a concept of major, minor, and patch. So when you have 1.2.3, your major version is 1, your minor version is 2, and your patch number is 3. Major version changes are only to be done when you have breaking changes. That so when I increment from 1.2.3 to 2.0, my users should expect that they may have problems. If you do 1.2.3 to 1.3 and you break, make breaking changes, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> as a package developer, I hate you. As, as, a, as a package user, to a package developer, that is. Um, minor should be used for adding features, so you know when something goes from 1.2 to 1.3, you know that they added something new, you should probably go read the, the change logs so that you can find out what's new. And bumping the patch version should be just there for bug fixes. So 1.2.3 to 1.2.4, no big deal. We can go ahead and use it. There shouldn't, you know, any, any minor or patch bumps, we should be able to go ahead and just go ahead and take the update, no big deal. So Semver, sorry. Semver has a certain syntax with, uh, within package.json that we should go through. And this is a really dense slide, but um, it's very it's, it's fairly valuable. So when we cat package.json, down here at the bottom, you notice Angular has caret 149, Lodash is caret 400, and Gulp is caret 390. That, that caret at the beginning means something. We'll get, that's actually one of the last thing we'll talk about, but we could go ahead and say, I only want this to be uh, anything greater than or equal to 390. So that's what's, that's what's happening up here. You can say, it has to be equal to 127. That's OK. You can go ahead and say, I don't ever want you not to use 127. It has, maybe it has some particular bug in it that you now depend on. Probably a bad idea, but let's just say you <laughs> depend on that bug. And if you really need 127, go ahead and stick that equal to 127. Don't ever let them change that. You can also do uh, an or. So let's say they, let's say something broke when they went from 127 to 128, but they fixed it in 130, right? So you can say, I want 127 or anything greater than 130 but less than 14. Which, it's important to note, if you leave off the dot .o, or if this was just, let's say this was less than 2, it will assume that's 2.0.0. Dot 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 it will zero fill any remaining versions. You can do ranges, so rather than have to type out 
to greater than or equal to and less than or equal to, you can go ahead and just say from 1.0 to 2.0 with a dash for your 2 in there. Um, you can also do wild cards. Capital X, lowercase x, and asterisk are wild cards, so they can be fulfilled by any number. So if you say equal, you know, if you were to say uh, less than, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of a good range for it. Basically, like 1.x would allow any 1.x dot whatever. You can also put that on the patch. Um, tilde is a little weird. It's patch only bumps, and there, but there's an exception in there. So if I do tilde one two three, that means it has to be between one two three and, but not anything that's one three something. So we only are allowed to bump the patch version. That means we're allowing bug fixes, but we don't want any new features. We don't want to go beyond that. It's kind of an odd choice, which is why it's not the default. Um, the default that you're going to see the most is tilde, which means no changes to the leftmost non-zero digit. It's kind of hard to understand, which is why I've got more examples of this than anything else. So your leftmost digit most of the time is going to be your, your leftmost non-zero is usually going to be your major version. So basically what you're saying is I'll allow any bug fixes, any feature additions, but no breaking changes. Now the exception to that is when you get over to O dot something packages, like O dot 7 dot 2, those have not hit 1.0, so the way that people tend to use those is that changes to the minor version number can include breaking changes, changes to the patch version number are fixes and additions. Um, that's been kind of a tumultuous. But o dot whatever packages are generally considered unreliable in, in the sense of it's at your risk to use them in production environments, but some of them are plenty useful, plenty stable. They just never got bumped to 1.0. Node was, Node was, didn't get its first 1.0 for how many years that people were using in production? Probably. Putty? Is yeah, it? I don't think it's ever at one dot. <laughs> well, putty pre predates seven. So, as far as I know. So, th this the, the idea that, that semantic versioning should be followed is has become really a big deal in, in recent years. So, um, I just want to make sure everybody understands this because if you go to read a package JSON, you go, okay, what does all this stuff mean? This is the this is the the important stuff that you should know. There are there's a whole grammar to this that you can do all kinds of weird things with this, but most people just want to be able to say, hey, this is how I guarantee that my package doesn't end up breaking. So generally speaking, you probably want Carrot. We already did this demo, which was how to use some scripts. Um, I want to go ahead and do uh, a little bit, though. So I, I've had a couple of uh, other package JSONs prepared in case I loved any of these demos and stuff like that. Um, this one, we actually can go ahead and, if you notice in the package JSON, I also went ahead, I actually, this was the one where I did the pre-install. Let me switch to that one. I'm surprised that it get reset hard didn't do it. There we go. I swear I know how to use this thing. So one of the things I changed was also test. Test. And your test fan goes here. Yay. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we'll actually go ahead and change this one later if I remember to get back to it. So. One other one that I'm not going to demo because it's very similar to NPM is Bower. It is a front-end package manager. Um, in some of my projects, I've gone ahead and tried to use Bower exclusively for my front-end packages. So I'm going to grab my, you know, I'm going to grab Angular and jQuery and uh, Bootstrap and things like that strictly from Bower. And then my back-end packages, so all of my tooling and stuff like that comes from <coughs> NPM. And that way we have a clear segregation between where our packages come from. Unfortunately, there's two big, my two big complaints with, with this strategy. One, you have two install steps. You then have to do an npm install, then a bower install, unless you script it into your npm script for pre-install or post-install. That's a little weird. Um, and also, not everything's in bower, and their search on their website is not good with like fuzzy searches. So like if you try to search for say Angular UI, uh, Bootstrap, like I've, I've come up with everything but the package I wanted, and I typed in the name of that you would commonly use. So you know it's my my, my first go to is usually npm, but if you want to have that kind of segregation, Bower is definitely um, a contender for for using that. It's installed from npm, so npm install dash g Bower. Initialized with Bower init, just like npm init, it'll put out a Bower.json. Um, one thing that's a little unique about it is it has also a Bower RC file. If you can set up all kinds of configuration in your project directories in and all the way up the directory chain from your project, as well as in your home directory and the root directory of the machine. So you can place these kinds of things in a num number of places so you can guarantee that you put it, say, in the root of the machine um, or in something like that, and you have multiple users sharing that, everyone would share on that machine would share the same power RC, at least at that level. So let's talk about unit testing. So I'm going to forewarn everyone. I have a demo in here that doesn't work. <laughs> I tried to fix it. I really did. Um, so let's talk about test stacks. Um, you know, in most languages, there is a preferred testing library, and that hasn't totally settled out with JavaScript. Um, you know, with Java, was it JUnit? With uh, most people who are doing Microsoft end up using NUnit unless they're strapped to what Microsoft puts out and then you're using MS test. Um, the Ruby community is really big on the RSpec. Um, JavaScript, first there was QUnit. It was the first big testing framework. It did well but it's old at this point. Um, Jasmine followed it up and was it was kind of a monolithic library of you know how to do testing. And it, it's done well. There's still plenty of open source, uh, plenty of software uh, projects out there in general using Jasmine, especially still in the open source community. But the combination that's sort of generally preferred by the community by now is Mocha, Chai, and Sinon. Um, basically, they broke apart it breaks apart the things that Jasmine does into three pieces. You have Mocha, which is your test framework, Chai, which is your assertion framework or library, and then Sign On, which is where you act actually that may not be the right pronunciation. That's just how I've always pronounced it. I don't know, um, but that's where you get your spies, stubs, and mocks. Um, so normally you would get all these. Th now some of these things in, in like say the .NET world. Your, your spies and stuff and that kind of stuff would be a separate library from your test framework. But usually your your test framework and your assertions come together. And here it's been broken up so that you can swap out how you do your assertions, you know, saying assert dot equal A is equal to, you know, A comma B. Maybe you want to do it what they call BDD style or, or, behavior, or behaviorally driven development style. So you want to say A dot should dot equal and then b. Well, this, this makes a whole lot more sense when you actually mm -hmm. read it. Um, so maybe you wanted to read a little more smoothly. Um, that, that's what Chai allows for. You can pick how you assert things and make it separate from the actual test harnesses. Something to note before we get into some of these. Um, spies, stubs, and mocks, they are different things. 
if you read, you know, you, people start talking about unit testing and they'll say, I, I mocked this out and really what they did was they created a spy or a sub. So spies still, when you turn a function, in sign on you are overriding functions basically. You're, you're taking away the original function and swapping it out with something else. Spies allow you to record the calls, the arguments, the return values from a function, um, what this was in that context, any exceptions thrown, but the function that you're that you are spying on still executes. So this is a great way to say, you know, somewhere deep inside of the method I'm testing, I really care if a particular construct was passed to a library. Well, I can spy on that library's function <coughs> and sh actually go in and rip the argument right back out and check it. We're not going to demo that one tonight, but that is possible. Um, stubs are spies with pre-programmed behavior, and now the function no longer runs. But we are able to set the return value of it, and we can even force uh, exceptions to be thrown. So um, I believe we're going to see at least one of those. And then mocks, mocks are something a little weird in this one, in this library. Uh, there's stubs, so there's spies with pre-programmed behavior and pre-programmed expectations. So we're asserting now that a method is called. Um, if you read the documentation on sign on, they basically say this should be, you should really only be using one mock at a time, and it's trying to make sure that some particular piece somewhere in your system was actually, actually ended up needing a mock proper in, in sign on. S between the spies giving me the ability to watch all the ins and outs, um, and the stubs allowing me to control what actually comes out. Um, stubs, think about what's important for stubs become important. Let's say you have a function in JavaScript that tries to make a call to a server. You don't want your test to actually make that call. Stubs become very important because you can say, okay, that, that function right there, if we're gonna stub that out, now it just returns my expected value. We just wanna know, you know, if we get that expected value back, then we know it was called. We can infer that that thing was called. Let's go ahead and tr try to walk through some of this. Um, hopefully, I can check out. I think we want to start here. All right. I would have had this open, but. This, the files for this don't exist in Village Branch. Uh, how are you? So, so suppose you had a stub for you know each function because you were testing. Well, what happens when this function it says it gets an x plus two and it returns a negative number and I have to handle that somehow. So, how do you handle large numbers of stubs? I mean, do you make a different branch for each test, or do you? I think it will become more clear when you see some of the, I've got some demo tests in here. If you're stubbing out a ton of stuff, well, there's probably a bigger problem with your code or your test. If you have a need to create 50 or even 20 stubs for one test, something's wrong. Um, and it's that, that smells of an architectural problem. Right. When you're unit testing, one of the things I probably should have <coughs> opened this section with is you, the idea behind unit testing, for those who are unfamiliar, the idea is you're trying to test one function. You don't, you know, and unless you care about maybe something it calls, you, you really want to make sure you only test that one function. And functions generally should be fairly, individual functions should be fairly short. So. You know, it calls this, it calls that, you know, it takes the, re the returns of those two things and it makes some decision based on that. You've got two, three stubs maybe in that kind of scenario. So th that's why I'm saying that, you know, generally speaking, you shouldn't have that many. I, I was thinking more of all of your unit tests as a whole. So in that case, let me show you a little bit of the, let me, let me move to something there. 
Uh, I'll bring it back up. So I went ahead and wrote a small Angular app today. You guys, can everybody read the code well enough, or should we zoom in a little bit? Okay. Can you guys read it in the back? Can you zoom up the front a bit? Let's see if we can turn the better mode on. Better? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, and I wanted to do this. We could have done this all in a command line or in some other editor. I wanted to do this in .NET because I know that there's a significant chunk of the community that, that does .NET. I want to show how we can go ahead and use some of these tools in spite of the fact that we're in .NET. Um, I did cheat a little bit here. And I moved package.json one level deeper because it makes more sense so I can view it from inside of my solution. So it's now inside of the project directory, which was inside of the directory we were just in. Um, I like to keep all of that stuff up at this level so I can see it nicely in the project that it's associated with, run back and forth on where it should belong, but this ends up seeming to be the, one of the better places for it. So, all right, let's go ahead and, just so everybody knows what's going on here. I've obliterated most of what for those of you who are familiar with ASP.NET and MVC, I've obliterated most of what you're used to seeing. So um, there is no view, really. It's just this main layout file. And it's going to instantiate a demo controller. We've got two main methods on it, go and block. And we can see when it's been blocked. And we can go, goes out to the GitHub API, queries it for my information, and then grabs my name off of it, and it's going to slap it on the screen. It's not a very glamorous demo. We can even look at it real quick. Maybe. Is that flickering up there? So, I can toggle block. When I get the name, hey, it's my name. <coughs> if I toggle block, I can no longer get the name. So the blocking function turns off the ability to grab the name. So, it works. Yay! But that's not what we're here for. So, that exists. And our, as we go through this, probably have to do some npm install. I have cheated and I have been editing and installing some packages as we go along. So you'll notice we have Angular jQuery and Lodash. And I went ahead and started installing some of our dev, de our dev dependencies for doing unit testing. So we have Chai, Mocha, and Sign On. Yep. And our demo controller here. So this is what we're going to test. We have a function go that call that if stop is not set, go ahead, call it, and when it comes back, grab the name and block flips the stop flag and nulls out the name. Now I may need to go one. So just to show you guys some of this stuff. For the moment, let's ignore some of this, all of this stuff up at the top. To do a test in Mocha, we first describe a block. So this is going to be our demo controller block. And inside of that, we can go ahead and execute some things before each other block inside of this or after each block. I will explain what those things do. And then we can describe more blocks inside of it. So we can go ahead and nest things. For example, if I want to have, in this case, I wanted to have a block for, to describe my controller. And then I want to have a block inside that that describes the block function. And down below, you'll see I have another block that describes the go function. Inside of that, then, we do it. And it is the actual individual unit test. 
the reason we do that is because it reads really, the reason they named it that way is because it reads really nicely. It flips the value of stop, or it sets the name to null. The whole idea in a, in a framework like this is to go ahead and make these things very readable so that the unit tests become almost like documentation for what the code does, how it should be used, etc. So it flips the value of stop. We go ahead and set up what stop is to begin with. It's false. We run block and demo controller should equal demo controller dot stop should equal true. So this part right here, the should equal true, that's chai. So there's a different describe and it come from Mocha and this English like syntax here should equal you can you can even do things if this were two objects being compared and you wanted to check at all of their properties all the way down you could say should be equal. And by some unholy magic, it figured out how to do this. I have not read the source code library. At some point, I probably should because it's amazing. Um, I've got references at the end. By all means, th this is not going to be anywhere near a comprehensive coverage of, of what these things can do, but it's worth understanding that. So the nice thing here is we've grouped together our, our tests for block. Up at the top, um, we're doing some stuff. So sign on has the ability between tests because of the scoping of variables in JavaScript, you want to be able to reset some of your stubs and spies and locks. So you can create a sandbox before each test and then use the sandbox to go ahead and um, instantiate all of your stubs out of it. And after each one, you hit restore on the sandbox and everything gets set back. So that's why that's up here. This stuff, for those who are, if you don't care about Angular, you won't care about any of this. But if you do care about Angular, you'll care. So first thing we need to do is we have to import our modules in Angular, because otherwise we can't really run our code. Then we can go ahead and provide, we can set up fake versions of various services. Actually, this is not the branch I want to be in. This is a better version of this code <laughs> that I worked on a little more. Um, so we have a demo repository. I didn't have a chance to show you guys that one yet. Let's go back to the controller real quick. We also have, instead of going directly to, to HTTP, we're going to call into this demo repository. And it makes our call to the server um, for us. That's what missing there. So we're going to go ahead and say when when Angular asks for a demo repository, don't go get the real one. Get this fake one. We have the ability to do that. And then there's some magic that we need to do to be able to actually get our controller out of Angular um, as well as a few other pieces that become important for asynchronous testing. So this is all great, but how do I run it? Right? To answer your question, the stubs are per test or per, you know, like this file would only be for demo controller. Realistically, if, if I need 50 stubs for this, demo controller is probably too large and should be broken up. Um, but the stubs for this one are kept separate from the stubs for if I had people controller and accounts con or accounts controller and things like that. Each one you would stub out different different things in their individual controllers. So in my opinion, it would be highly unlikely that you would hit a critically large number of stubs and spies um, in any one controller. Um, if you're at that point, there's probably, like I said, there's probably, we're, we're really get, getting to that point where we're like, something is architecturally wrong here. We need to break this thing apart. Um, one way to do that in Angular is uh, specifically is you can use services and factories, which are then little modules that can be sucked into the controllers and you can, it is generally considered a best practice to move your logic out of controllers into services. So that's how I would probably handle that kind of thing. There's not, I don't have a better answer, you know, oh, there's this magic trick and you can do these things. Um, it's just, 
You want to avoid that situation. That that means you're in trouble. So your it was, was, was the magic trick that I saw. Okay, so you're talking about rather than just having to. I mean, just just think if you did it all with a bash script and you just rewrote your source code and then tested it and then rewrote your source code and then tested it. Yeah, these these are nice encapsulations of all you know. One of the one of the things as a side note that I like to do, and it's not really built demoed well here, is like in, inside of content, I would put a folder for each module, and then I break my features apart into folders inside of there. And my test directory down here mirrors that exact same directory structure. And my files then here, like I have demo controller JS here, I have demo controller tests JS down here. So it's the exact same file name with tests dot tests appended. Um, right before the file extension. So. Uh, uh, another weird question, could you do, could you do like conditional commits where it only, it only commits if you, uh, if it passes all tests or do you manually run the test or? So, or that or is that. It's a little out of scope of what I plan to talk about, but it gets into the realm of things like continuous integration okay. um, and there are, I believe there are ways to do this with Git. Somebody who knows more about like Git hooks. There's anybody in the room? Jenkins. Right. So, so Jenkins is continuous integration. So when you check in, it can go ahead and run your tests, and you can wire that up to an email reporter that can send you an email afterwards. But the code's already been committed. Um, I want to say. Jenkins can pause the commit process. Jenkins. Oh, okay. I. I so. I don't know everything about CI, I'll admit that. So um, I know that there are also hooks in Git. I believe there are hooks in Git that you could inject something else into the process. Um, but that is. You know, pretty terrible. Hmm? It seems like a pretty terrible idea. Well, you know, actually, there are places that inject linting step, and we'll talk a little about, about linting yeah, later. It's quick, that's like a second, right? Like a good, a good test week could take four hours to run. Right? You're going to have four hours to commit. Yeah. I would argue that a good test suite does not take four hours to run. <laughs> Especially a unit test suite. Yeah, a good unit test suite shouldn't take four hours to run. Now, not saying it doesn't happen, but unit tests should stand up quickly, run, and tear down. If there are that many dependencies or if it's relying on any sort of I.O. to files or a database, you're, you're doing it well, wrong. If you're writing a database and you're writing there, there's time. And I, I'm not. A, I'm not. I'm not going to say there's never a time where there's appropriate. But like in, in um, there's a whole video series uh, Gary Bernhardt did on Rails and unit testing, and he made sure none of his tests ever had to go through the process of spinning up Rails, for example. If that if he had stood up Rails for each individual test, it would have taken far longer. That's that's more the realm of what I'm talking about. Not saying that there aren't scenarios where you might have that kind of. It's, that's not dogma, but it's a generally, you know, it's a, it's a generalization that usually holds true. Um, sorry, off topic. <laughs> We've gone off in a, in, into a ditch many to re, re, uh, So we don't know how to run. That was the issue. So let's go back to our slides and talk about the karma. Karma is an automatic test runner. So anytime you edit a test, anytime you edit a file, it can go ahead and rerun those and report to you what happened. It's all powered by something called karma.conf.js. It's the config file that runs Karma. And then the rest of the setup is all plugins, which are downloaded from NPM. So we're, all, we're always going back to NPM for this stuff. That's why we started there. Um, key parameters there, browsers. Um, this allows you to, the, the, the browser that most people are going to use here is Phantom.js, which is a headless browser. So the beauty of this is it automatically runs your test in a browser that never shows up. So you, it actually runs it in a browser environment. That's one of the things that's beautiful about Karma. You know, it's, it's actually running against a real, know, WebKit engine. Um, so you're not like, oh, well, it worked here in the unit test, but it doesn't run in a browser. Why? It's actually running it in a browser. Um, most people use use the Phantom 
browser plugin, but you can swap that out for Chrome and it'll pop up a Chrome instance and you can actually use the Chrome debugger that way. Or you can use manual access uh, to their default URL. You can configure that URL if you want to. Um, files, you have to go ahead and put in, in order, the files that you want loaded. So ideally, you would load your files in the same order, like for example, your libraries and your application files. You'd load those in the same order that you would load them into a browser. Um, frameworks, Mocha, Chai, and Sign-On, those are usually your frameworks, or whatever your test suite you're using, Jasmine, you put that in there. Um, reporters, that determines how the results get displayed. Um, there are, I should have used, actually, I regret it now, I should have used the Nian reporter. Um, you can actually get like a Nian cat uh, animated in your console, and it will tell you, you know, the farther he goes, the more tests it runs that pass. Um, I, I, I've shied away from committing that one into our, our configurations for work. I really want to, though. <laughs> um, and then preprocessors, um, Babel, which relates to ECMAScript 6, which we will, and I'm, this is not uh, very good foreshadowing, it's very blatant, but we are going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, so let's go ahead and demo some of this. In the interest of time, maybe I don't have any test screen. I thought there was a bit more. We already have it. We already have it. Hooray! So we talked about the primary configuration, and this is a very simple one, but we're going to go ahead and load our frameworks. Now, it's important to note for this, that the package JSON, you have to have Mocha, Chai, and Zynon installed, but then you also have to have the Karma adapters for them. So there's Karma Mocha, there's Karma Chai, there's Karma Zynon, and these, those are actually what get loaded in as frameworks to, to uh, bridge the gap. Those force the test runner, the, the test frameworks to be loaded into your environment. That's why if you go ahead and if you look at this, you'll notice there's no references here to anything related to, other than the use of describe and it and the should equal and stuff. You never explicitly say load sign on, load mocha, or any of that stuff. Sorry. Carmen does all that for us through this. Same thing with the reporters. So we have our Mocha reporter. We have our Phantom JS launcher. So there's our reporter. Browsers are your launchers. And then we load in our files. And if you're an, an Angular user, make sure you load your modules first or you're going to have problems um, after Angular, I should have said. Um, so you load Angular. You load Angular mocks, which is necessary for Angular unit testing. You load all of your stuff that makes up your app, and then you load your tests. And magic happens. So we start Karma with Karma start. And I have two failing tests. So this is what Karma does. It says no captured browser, open this, then it says Karma's. Karma server started, it started, starts the phantom browser, connects to it, and then runs the tests. And so the format of how this looks is my Mocha reporter. If I had Nyan, the Nyan reporter, it would look like a Nyan cat. Um, you guys want to see that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come a little this is too serious. <coughs> Uh, I'm guessing I'm going to there. <clears throat> All right. Let's go ahead and switch the reporter to the end. And there's our dead hand cat. <laughs> 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 um, 
Unfortunately, we're probably not going to get to see him live because my dad demo is one of the unit tests. Um, so one of those, let's go ahead and comment that one out. This unit test down at the bottom, but let's talk about it first because this is the this is where I'd hope to demo sign on for you guys, and it didn't work. Um, the big thing here is basically we've talked about how to set up the sandbox, how to tear down the sandbox, uh, but our demo repository, we call it get method on that. And what should have worked, and for some reason isn't, is we replace get with a stub. And then we actually do some angular magic with uh, promises so that we can return our expected <coughs> name is going to be Roadrunner. And we call our demo controller go. And what should have happened is when demo controller calls demo repository.get, we should see this data come back, and then it would get set in here. Now, the, the big thing, and this is my, I think one of my last big tips to Angular people, is if you don't, if you start doing stuff with Q and uh, so that you can fulfill promises, if you don't do this root scope apply at the end, you're going to cry for hours. Because your <laughs> promise will never resolve. <laughs> Promises, for those who are unfamiliar, are representations of asynchrony. So it is the, when you run a function that's asynchronous, you have a callback that's supposed to execute a promise, is the idea that that, that, that uh, callback, sorry, the idea that that asynchronous operation has completed. So you can, with a promise, you don't know when you have it whether or not it has completed. But when it has resolved, you can then hook up a then method to it that will be called as soon as it is resolved. Or if it's resolved, it should be called essentially immediately, although it's not, it's still asynchronous in time. Your code, you know, your code may continue to flow on. Um, so promises are very interesting. Unfortunately, they're not part of the talk to this talk. ES6, when we get to that, that'll be more probably for where that goes. But I figured I should explain what I'm talking about. Um, so what we're doing there is essentially saying when that asynchronous call resolves, it should return this result right here. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. So the other big thing is you have, in these cases, you have a done argument that allows you to tell the test framework that you are done. If you insert this done, you have to call it. Does that make sense? Does it have an expect before What's that? Does it have like an expect, like expect to before Does what have an expect? Like, the, like in terms of stubs? Or no, the, the, uh, the test from this? Yeah. Or no, I guess not. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. That's Some test runners, you can say, hey, I should be too fast. Um, Inside of here. Never mind. I not that I know of. All right. Never mind. Proceed. So we're going to go ahead and comment that out. We want to see the end cat live and not die. Oops. So he's still dead. <laughs> but we have two. We have. We have. Uh, there we go. That's more what I was expecting. We have one failing test. So two, two tests now, because we commented out one. One passed, one failed. And the problem here, it's saying that null is not an object when evaluating this. The problem is that we expected null to come back. Well, null dot should isn't going to get us anywhere. So something that, if you're ever testing for nulls, there's an alternative syntax. You can do should equal and then two arguments. And the end cat lives. <laughs> if you have more as, as I understand the reporter, if you have more tests, he goes farther and farther and farther. Um, so. Kill that. And go back to Fletcher. So. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to skip debugging. But the basic idea is you go to the URL that we've talked about there. And a whole page, a page loads up, actually. 
to at least show. Let's show it. There it is. So we can go ahead and debug. And we have the ability then here to actually debug those tests. I'm not going to throw the breakpoints in there and everything right now, but we know that it works. Or we know the idea that we load the page should work. Build tools. We're going to go through this really quick. So two big ones came out of the community. First was Grunt, then was Gulp. Um, the big difference there is config versus code. Grunt, if you ever go out and read a Grunt file, I went to try to do that. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, it, it's basically saying, you basically configure a bunch of sections and say, go ahead and load this module, this module, this module, and here are the settings for those modules. But it's not really something, to me at least, that makes sense and, you know, well, this is what, you know, I should, I should be able to read this and make sense of it. Gulf is code. And it, for that matter, it's very linear code. It makes a whole lot of sense. We'll talk about it a little bit. Supposedly, the developer community has decided that Webpack is going to dethrone, at least those, the powers that be, decided that Webpack is going to dethrone Gulp, although Gulp seems to be hanging on pretty strong. Um, it, it seems to be more popular in the, in the, the uh, Re uh, React community, as it is more, I think it aligns more with how React thinks. Now, uh, Josh, you're the React guy. Okay. <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah, along with you said. Okay. I thought I, I thought I, you're, I a re, you're a resident React expert. Back. What? I actually need front more than that. Okay. But it doesn't um, matter. No, you this is. You want it in. You want something to build something. For. Right. So this is, a, I should point out, this is an opinionated, I should have pointed this out at the beginning. This is a very opinionated talk. These are the tools I like and I use. You're welcome to try. I, I mentioned the competitors because you're welcome to go use them and learn about them as well. Um, but I wanted everybody to get out of here the ability to go home and you know try to start using npm, try to start using Mocha Chai, Sinon Karma, and Gulp, um, and be able to build stuff with that. So Gulp is a pipeline concept. The idea being, if you again going back to if you're a Linux user, if you've ever um, catted a file and then piped it into sed and then piped it into less, you know what pipes are or anything like that. You can take the output of one thing and shove it into another. It's the exact same thing that, that Gulp does. It also can do these things in parallel, though. So you can say, I have these four tasks, kick all of them off at the same time, and then they can pipe, 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 and when they're done, it wraps up. Does it, what, what level of parallelism can you use? As much as it can. The, the only, Restriction to parallelism is the interdependency between your <coughs> tasks. Um, I don't have a, I'm not going to be able to demo a really crazy Gulp file, um, unfortunately, but I have one that I built for work that's ultra generic and it can kick, it kicks off like five different tasks in parallel and builds our entire app in a matter of seconds. So, does the entire pipeline in memory? So nothing ever gets you know written to disk and then reread and then written to disk and reread. You just do the whole thing. There's no temp files unless you decide that you want to write temp files. And it's a fairly simple API. You have Gulp Task, Gulp Source, Gulp Dest, and Gulp Pipe. Task defines your individual tasks. Source says where are the files I want to start working with from. Dest allows me to write whatever's in my current pipeline to a spot, and Pipe allows me to go ahead and build my pipeline. There's one more in there that I forgot to put in the slide, which is watch, um, which allows you to put a file watcher on a certain source and then go ahead and rerun a set of tasks based on that. So let's go ahead and do some golf real quick. Nope, not cheap. 
So we have a new file here called builtfile.js, and we'll take a quick look at our package JSON before we get into that. So we have a couple of new things. We have gulp concat, gulp plumber, gulp rim wrap, and gulp source maps. Um, what we're going to see here is a fairly stripped down pipeline, um, but I hope it may, starts to make some sense as to what you can do with it. So the idea in Gulp here is that we, first of all, we have to bring in all the modules, unlike Karma where we could set up a config file and say, well, here are my modules, go get them. Here we're actually essentially writing, um, essentially writing Node.js. So we're using nodes, requ uh, nodes require uh, to pull in modules. So we pull in Gulp, we pull in Gulp Cat, Plumber, RimMap, source maps. Um, Plumber up, we'll get out of the way real quick. It's there as a fix for some issues in nodes streams that when they error, they tend to break in a way that's not compatible with Gulp. So we start all of, we start most of our pipelines by piping it through Plumber, which fixes it, which kind of patches that up and keeps it from breaking. Um, so the, what we're going to demo here is we're going to take all our JavaScript file. We're going to have a clean which is RimRap, so that allows us to rm-rf, RimRap, for those unfamiliar. Um, we're going to clean our directory, we're going to concatenate our JavaScript files together, and we're going to push out some source maps so that our browser can still let us debug nicely. Um, I would do, well, actually, let's, let's make this a little, we'll make it a little more interesting here uh, and do some modification too. And we, we pulled in Karma as well. So what we're going to be able to do, when we run gulp, just the command gulp, we should be able to build up all the JavaScript together and kick off Karma at the same time. So there's a special task in gulp called default. And when you type just gulp at the command line and hit enter, default gets run. You never gulp default. You just gulp. Um, so the first argument to task is the name of the task. The second argument can either be an array of other tasks that it is dependent upon, or it can be a function. Um, a third option is that you can put an array followed by a function. And this function, whether it's in second or third position, is what that build step actually does. So you can have build steps that don't do anything, they just mandate that other build steps run. You can have build steps that aren't dependent on anything, they just run, for example, gulp test here. Um, or you can have ones that are dependent that other things run and then they do something. Does that make sense? And when you have these here, they run in parallel. So dependent tasks always run in parallel. There are changes coming to Gulp in version 4.0 uh, where you will be able to do series and parallel tasks and there are people that have found who have written workarounds for doing perfectly serial tasks, um, which you can generally just do by saying, this is dependent upon that, that's dependent upon that. There are a couple of edge cases I've run into where, you're gonna, where you'll still need something else. Uh, so, We've got default running build and test. Build runs clean and build app. Test goes ahead and kicks off a Karma server. And build, well actually we'll skip build, jump down to clean. Clean, so this is a, a good example of our first pipeline. Gulp source is gonna be our public folder, which we haven't seen yet, but it will be created. We're gonna go ahead and pipe the public folder into RimRap, and basically we're just going to obliterate it. Makes sense, that's what clean should do. That's what you would expect it to do. Gulp build app, we're going to go ahead and just grab two, well actually, we're going to grab Angular, 
and then we're going to go ahead and grab everything in our content directory. This syntax here comes from a library called Minimatch. The star star in the middle there means any directory or any subdirectory down the chain. So you can be 10 levels deep and then have a JavaScript file there and that syntax will pick it up. So this is any JavaScript file in any subdirectory below, in any in content or any subdirectory below that. We're going to pipe it through Plumber to fix the pipeline. We're going to pipe it through the source maps in it so that we can start tracking what we're doing for the sake of the source maps. And which source maps are the files that allow your browser to understand garbled JavaScript. So let's say you took 20 files, shoved them into one, and then minified it. You can use source maps to read the original JavaScript and debug it, even though it's been 20 files have been shoved into one and garbled up. So we go ahead and concatenate all of the files into one in the order from up here. We write our source maps, which is not the actual writing of the file system. We're adding it to the stream that was already started with source. And then finally, we write the whole contents that's in the pipeline right now to a folder public slash JS. So it'll end up creating those directories if they don't exist. That makes sense? Any questions? All right. So let's go ahead and see if does it work. So we scroll up. We see that it started clean, which was the first thing that had to run. Then it ran build app. It also kicked off test. It finished clean. So test started running. So keep in mind, Karma is now on the hook to the same process, the same standard out as uh, as Gulp. So you're going to get mixed messages in here. That's the that's the up and down of this, is that you can kick off a bunch of stuff, but you have to figure out what comes from where. The build app finishes, the build then finishes, and we should now have, if we kill Karma, we should be able to go into pub, or public, JS, and we have an app JS and a map. So let's go ahead and Let's go take a look. Sure, go ahead and fix it. So we start with Angular, and down at the bottom, 29,000 lines in, is all of our code. But if we go ahead and run this, actually, that's not going to work. I haven't fixed the, the index file to properly reference this. If we were to be able to run that correctly, and my demo was all finished and set up, we would be able to uh, go into the browser and see the app, this one file loaded up, but if there's another sources directory that comes up that then you can go in and place your breakpoints and do all that kind of stuff. So, um, what I didn't have time to write and we wouldn't have had time to go over anyway, it looks like, uh, is the actually that in this gulp file, what you can then do is you can go ahead and build your CSS. There's all kinds of plugins for that. Um, you can even run a web server out of gulp. There is one, that, a package gulp web server, that features even live reload. So you change your file. It causes the pipeline. You set up a watch so that your pipeline runs when your file changes. It runs the pipeline, which causes it new files to be dumped into the output directory, which web server is watching. It causes a hot reload. You now didn't have to do anything in your web, you know, the page that you're working on, you can see the changes that's to it. So I wish I could demo all of it, but my, my current gold file is about 150 lines long, and that's not including my external config file. So one of the other things that we can go ahead and do, that I like to do, is I go ahead and do our config equals require dot slash build.js. And I define a whole separate JavaScript file 
And in that one, we'll pretend this is in this block that that's it. You do a module dot exports, and it's just an object. And you can fill this thing then with, let's say, app. And it is all, I can now put in all of my file names or mini match strings so I can be like, So I can put that in here, and then I can do, I down in here, let's just say we were only building the app files. Now I can do create.app. And all of a sudden, I can start to build up a very, very generic gulp file that I can reuse over and over and over again. So I've spent the last couple of days off and on writing one of these, and it's the power inside of a pipeline like this. I have the ability, there is a another plugin called Gulp If that allows you to do things conditionally. So also in that config file, I have another section where I can, I have different environments set up. And I can say, when I'm doing development work, don't minify everything, because that takes a lot longer. Just go ahead and concatenate everything and write my source maps and that goes a whole lot faster. When I go to build for production or go to build for our, our QA environment, go ahead and do all those things. That way we know that this thing's going to work when we actually deploy it. You can turn source maps off. You can, I mean, I can turn, you know, when I run the build for production, I don't turn Karma on. I don't turn the web server on. All those things can be gated. There's a couple different ways you can do it. You can just, inside test, you can say, if config dot Karma. If not, config karma. Turn. Done. We just booted our way out of there. You can also extract out your list of dependent tasks into a variable and conditionally push task names into it. So there's a bunch of different ways that I found that you can you can make gulp into your puppet, not not puppet, the actual thing. Um, <laughs> you can control gulp in a whole bunch of different ways using other gulp modules and things like that. Um, I wish we could take a, spend a lot more time on that. A um, few outs and ends. I know we're about to run over, but I want to make sure I at least have, show you guys these slides. Linters allow you to check for basic errors, code styles, and inconsistencies. So missing semicolons saying, hey, we're always going to use single quotes instead of double quotes in JavaScript. Um, JSLint was the original linting library that people started using, which gave way to JSHint, and now there's JSCS and ESLint. Um, ESLint is the one that I really like and highly configurable. They use custom rules, parses for JavaScript, actual, AS, actual abstract syntax tree. So it's it's a highly powerful library that's highly customizable and you can set up a configuration that you can share with your team. Um, transpilers, so this is, I keep talking about Babel in a couple of spots and ES6. Um, Babel was formerly known as 6 to 5, it's a library that actually can compile most of the syntax for um, ECMAScript 6 in backwards into ES5 syntax so that you can actually run it in a browser. Um, it's composed of a library that actually does the compilation as well, or, or a chunk of code that does the compilation, as well as a polyfill that you can bundle in with the page so that the rest of the functionality still works. Um, they have competition with Tracer, um, and I think there's a few others out there, but this is easily the biggest one. Um, we'll go ahead and move on there. There's, if you're interested in learning more about it before we ever get a talk on it, definitely go check them out. Um, they have a, a Gulp plugin, so you can run your ES6 code through a Gulp through your Gulp pipeline, convert it through Babel, concatenate it, publify it, write the source maps. It all works. Module loaders. Um, yeah, we're gonna skip that one. <laughs> it's a very it's, it's a very involved topic that I I'm still wrapping my head around to a certain degree. Um, they're 
competing standards. The big thing to take away probably from this is ES6 now has a definition for how modules should be imported and whatnot, but uh, it's not supported by browsers, so people are using Babel to convert the ES6 code to AMD or CommonJS, which are the two competing standards that currently exist. Basically, the idea is you replace your script tags with module loaders, so you load one initial script that kicks off the chain and it, it then loads things for you. In scaffolding, this isn't personally something I've used, but it is well within the topic. Basically, you know, if, you, if you're in Visual Studio and you say, I want a new project, it goes and creates all these files for you. There's no such, you know, how do I do that in JavaScript? Yeoman is a tool that's very popular for that. You install the tool, you install your generator, and you run it, and it'll give, spit out some boilerplate codes so that you can get moving faster with your project. Questions? <laughs> I hope all of that made sense. I'm not sure if no questions is good or bad. <laughs> um, thank you guys. I appreciate, you, especially with all the problems I've had with demos and um, even getting this thing together. It's not been friendly to me. So the fact that there even is a presentation is probably a miracle. Um, not gonna lie. Some, I've included some resources, so when I send this out, um, you guys can go and look up the various tools. Um, but that is all I got.